Good afternoon. Jeff Raspi here with you on 90.5 The Night, Brookdale Public Radio. And it is, as always, a pleasure to welcome Suzanne Vega to our... Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I Hi. think you've actually been to our, ac- our studios at least two or three times over the years. So this is the first time we're doing it this way. Um, yeah. I guess that's usually the case. <laughs> yes. It's a lot of, lot of first time. <laughs> a lot of first time remote interviews. Um, so, uh, the reason we're talking to you today is that you are coming back to the Jersey Shore to play on, I believe it is Thursday, October 14th at the Vogel at the Count Basie Theater in Red Bank, um, a place where I presume you've not been before because it only opened in the middle of the pandemic last year. Um, (laughs) um, have have you ever played the Count Basie? I want to say you did. I honestly don't know. Um, I mean, I'd have to go back through years of itineraries to figure oh, sure. out which, and when I get there, I would be able to tell you, oh yeah, I've played here before. Exactly. But, uh, you know, the names, I'm not so sure. The green room, I would remember, and the stage. <laughs> yeah, so the, so the Count Basie Theater is a long time big theater uh, in Red Bank. And during the pandemic, I mean, obviously they started working on it before the pandemic, but in the middle of the pandemic, they reopened, or they opened, this place called the Vogel, which is literally right next door. Um, cool. With um, it's it's kind of a large black box theater, and your your show will be, I think, like almost every show has been so far, uh, seated and limited capacity. Okay. Um, but I guess Great. that's also a new norm. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, so. The most recent release from you was your An Evening of New York Songs and Stories, uh, which came out last year. And uh, it's funny, the the first thing I thought of was, oh, Suzanne Vega, like one of the most iconic New Yorkers doing, you know, a show because it was recorded uh, live. Um, Yeah. uh, Did you know before thinking of doing this that you'd been you know all these years decades now of writing songs that New York was playing such a a huge part did I know before I did the show right I had you realized um because in my in my mind I'm thinking especially somebody who's been writing songs as long as you have you may not realize that you've brought New York into as many songs as you have without, I I did without having it yeah. p- being pointed out. Well, here's the thing. Uh, the Cafe Carlisle, which is where we recorded this album, is not just a venue. In fact, most of it is a hotel um, and a pretty upscale swanky one as well. <laughs> so I knew that I would be playing to people who didn't know my music necessarily, um, but came in from out of town who needed a hotel. So uh, the thing about the Carlisle is it's almost like a little theater. They expect you to put on a show. It's not like a normal folk club or a normal rock and roll club. You do two weeks there and you have like an opening night and it helps to have a theme. So I thought, what's the theme gonna be? And I thought, oh, the theme is New York, obviously. I mean, because if you have tourists who come in from out of town, to New York City, that it, the show would be interesting to them. Yeah. And then if you have locals who want to hear songs about New York, who then it would be interesting to them too. So by the end of the first week, it, it was a really popular show. And by, we knew that we should probably record a few nights in the second week. Cool. So that's how that happened. Yeah. Because um, it, it also got me thinking, you were doing uh, your series of close-up records too. Uh, sort of reworking and re-recording stuff from your catalog. And those were all themed too, right? Yeah, they were. (laughs) And I did that on purpose. (laughs) Uh, Like like if you look at Taylor Swift right now, she's doing re-records, but she's doing them by album. And then she's doing like Taylor's version of like, you know, I can't remember the names of that, Red or whatever. Um, So, but I didn't want to do that. I thought, first of all, it would be impossible to re-record them exactly. And I wanted to re-record them acoustically. And I thought, let's do them by mood. Mm-hmm. Because then that way you've got your classic 
um, the classic songs are all on the ones called People in Places. So you've got Luca, Tom's Diner. Uh, but the first one was called Love Songs. So that's a completely different mood. And then the third one is States of Being. So you've got the really freaky, um, kind of abrasive, um, you know, edgier stuff on that one. Um, it was a lot of fun. So I thought if you're in this kind of mood, you can play the love songs, or if you're in that kind of mood, you can play the, the edgy or freaky stuff. Right. And that, uh, was that again with the whole, uh, maybe it was happening subconsciously um, when you decided to go themes and not just re-record album one, solitude standing, you know, that in order or even or whatever. Um, yeah. Did you suddenly realize that, Oh, I have an album's worth of songs that are written about sort of abrasive misfits or an album's <laughs> worth of songs written about, you know, different, you know, ways to look at love. Stuff right. like that. Um, I didn't know, but I suspected because <laughs> when I put together a live show, a live set, there are times where I'll do a little theme in the middle. You know, I'll do songs that I think will do, make a good opening. And then we have songs that are good closing songs. And then I'll do a little set in between of whatever the theme of the day is, whether it's New York City or maybe it's songs about traveling or if I'm in a place by the ocean, maybe I'll do water themes. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got a bunch of songs that have, have to do water and, and being by the ocean and uh, that kind of thing. So, you know, I like to do that. And this was kind of an overspill of that way of thinking. Nice. Jeff Raspi here with Suzanne Vega again here at 90.5 the night. Um, and it's, it's funny leading up to today, I was trying to, I know, I know there were at least two times you came on the air with me live in the studio. One was on your way out of town for a tour. And then two or three months later on the way back, <laughs> you came by again. <laughs> Um, hey. <laughs> <laughs> just say hey how'd tour go um and and i i'm pretty sure there was at least one other time you uh i think you were on with with uh rich who's on before me um because i can remember jerry being there that time sure so the upcoming show at uh the vogel at the basie in red bank on uh, the 14th of october is that going to be with the full band or it's with jerry it's with oh, jerry okay. leonard with you and jerry okay great yeah Fingers suddenly 
legacies as they clean up every corner. Wash down every street Mark the month And all its anniversaries Put away The draft of all your eulogies Clear the way For all your private memories As they They meet you upon each corner They meet you on each street Make the time For all your possibilities Live on every street um, And actually and I don't remember if you and Rich talked about this How, because I think most people Will know Jerry From his time in David Bowie's band Yeah How did, and he's, and he's English How did you He's and he, Irish Oh, he's, he's Irish. Irish He's Irish Big difference. Yep. Note taken. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, so how did you and he end up crossing paths? And because uh, you, you guys worked together now for a long time. Yeah, a long time. Uh, I met him through Rupert Hine, who uh-huh. was the producer for of the album called Songs in Red and Gray. And he put together the band for that album. And Jerry Leonard was in that band. Um, and I thought he was a brilliant guy uh and i loved what he played on the album and then here's the interesting part uh while we were playing jerry informed me that he could play all of my parts my guitar parts the way i play them which is very rare i Mm -hmm. I have a sort of self-taught method so cut to 9 11 9 11 happened two weeks before this album came out I was in a bicycle accident and had broken my left arm and I was about to go on tour to promote this album and all the world was falling down, but we decided to go on tour anyway. So I went to Jerry and I said, could you please come on tour with us? Because I can't play the guitar. Um, So he did. He uh, came on tour with me and played my guitar parts just like I do. And then David Bowie came knocking on the door. So he said, bye, Suzanne. (laughs) (laughs) See ya, <laughs> and went off to play with David Bowie. Uh, so I would get him back, you know, from time to time. Um, in fact, I don't know if I should tell you this, but the one time I met David Bowie, I said to him, uh, I sort of blurted out what was on my mind. And I said, when he's not yours, he's mine. Uh, which I thought later was like, why did I say that? You know, did I need to really say that? But whatever, it, it was a funny moment and it worked. It, well, I was going to so. say, it, it's funny. And, and I would hope that David at least chuckled. He did. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was. He was amazingly suave. He was very, very charming. Yes. Yes. Um. <laughs> Not to mention, he looked awesome. <laughs> he was there in a white linen suit after being rained on in the uh, in the during the show. It was, oh, oh. it was really spectacular. It was a moment I'll never forget. Yeah. Oh, I'll bet. Yeah. Here for Aspie here with Suzanne Vega on ninety point five the night Thursday October fourteenth at the Vogel at the Basie in Red Bank and uh, taking a quick look at your uh, tour schedule. Two days later, the 16th at the Scottish Rite Auditorium in Collingswood, which is um, not that far away. It's it's over near Camden on the other side of New Jersey. So if folks are uh, closer to that or uh, it's a better night for you, you can uh, look that up, Scottish Rite Auditorium. Uh, so the we mentioned the close-up series um uh, was it four or five did you end up doing oh gosh um I, it's four actual uh whatever we call them now are there are they're actually going to be albums because mm-hmm. it's coming out on vinyl but we're doing a box set vinyl coming out in february of next year oh so there there is a fifth 
album, but it's extras and sort of special things. Um, but there's it was actually volumes one, two, three, and four. four. So it was four. Oh, I didn't even know about the upcoming vinyl box sets. That yeah, will be yeah. Cool. We've, we've just put that together. Yeah, it will be cool. It's very, it's amazing, really, how vinyl just keeps going. Um, <laughs> so it, it's a really nicely put together um, package. I'm very proud of it. Cool. And, and um, the close-up series and uh, the New York Songs and Stories and this new box set are all on a label that you started? Yeah. Nice. Yes, called Amanuensis. Um, and actually, there's two other albums on that, uh, on my own label, too. It's the, the Lover Beloved album with the songs from the Carson McCullers play. Mm -hmm. And then I had a, uh, an album that came out in 2014, I think it was, called um, Tales from the Realm of the Queen of Pentacles, right. which most people can't remember the title, but it's, um, <laughs> that's what the title is. So, so there's that. Yeah, yeah it's, I, 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 I've been very happy. I was I was going to say because I've known over the years I've now known a number of uh, and I say this with <laughs> with love and respect former major label artists who yeah. have, who have taken it upon themselves to uh, start releasing music on their own most often um, to to great benefit um, I mean there's a lot of uh, stuff that has to happen from point A to point Q, uh, yeah. <laughs> that you probably weren't that hands on with while on a major label because they had entire staffs that were supposed to do that. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I who was, I think it was Juliana Hatfield I was talking to years ago. And one of the few, th you know, one of the things that she just hadn't wrapped her head around until it had to be done was the mailings. <laughs> like she was like, my apartment is full of padded mailers and, and mailing labels. <laughs> and he's like, and she's like, I, I did not see this coming. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, there's ways, you know, sometimes if you make a distribution deal, they'll do that in their offices. Uh, so that, you know, people have different ways of configuring it. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, so was, um, was it just a matter of you wanting uh, more control of, the, the again the process from point a to point z of making putting together releasing promoting um you know all those things that a label is supposed to do which depending on what label you're on and how many records come out the same week right i'll tell you my story i mean it's an interesting story because i started off with a major label i started off with a m records um and we were successful almost right away right. I mean, in my first five years with AM Records, I sold three, no, I sold five million albums. My first five years with AM. Yeah. Who's, no one's going to be unhappy with that. Um, so I, I was on AM Records for a total of 18 years. Um, and I loved it. And I never had a problem with them. Uh, I could do what I wanted to, even in my experimental phase with 99.9, .9, they were super. Um, supportive and pretty much gave me everything and anything I wanted. Um, once it stopped being A and M and became uh, it, it 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 got bought out. Yes, you know, I uh, yeah, in like two thousand was it or something like that. It was in that area, so I could kind of feel that my days were numbered. And uh, one day the shoe dropped, and they said bye, thanks. So I uh, went, I figured I, I had lunch with Jerry Moss to thank him actually for 18 great years. And we had coffee and that was really interesting. Cool. Um, and then I went for a while with no record deal. Then I got signed to Blue Note. Um, and I thought I had a really great album. I had the Beauty and Crime album mm -hmm. on Blue Note and it won a Grammy and everything. And that relationship lasted two years. <laughs> And then they cut, they were like, bye, see ya. And then I'm on the back doorstep. So I thought, wow, that, uh, who, what happened? Um, so, so I thought, I don't want to go through that again. So uh, I was working at that time with Michael Hausman, who was Amy Mann's manager. And I really admired what she had done with her own record label. Yeah. So we did the same thing. We set up Amanuensis. Um, I didn't have any new songs at that point. I wanted to, to build up my audience. 
I was new to Facebook at that time too. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll do these re-records and I'll build up my audience on Facebook and, you know, see how it goes. And it's taken a while, but um, I'd say probably since 2014, 2015, I've made a profit every year. Oh, and cool. I've been very happy with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Probably yeah. a little more information than you wanted, but that's, <laughs> That's my relationship with major labels. Yeah, no, and and that's that's um, it's not more than I wanted because I actually no. <laughs> I've been I've been doing this long enough that I I like to like see that part of it too. Um, I mean, you know, I think the the strangest part of that story is uh, uh, Blue Note, which is supposed to be you know total artist friendly, and you kind of do. I mean, all those years of uh you know being a the premier jazz label and you know yeah you want to make you know an album of squeaks and squawks okay that's fine <laughs> but uh yeah. Yeah, so that was weird um in the story it surprised me i was very i was really thrown by that but you know pick myself up dust myself off start all over again and that's what i did yeah did, did i mean that far into your career did you did you actually feel like you were starting over yeah, uh, I did in a way because it was a new era. I mean, the we're talking about t what is it? What's t we're in 2021 now. So it was about 10 years ago or maybe 11 or 12 years. So, there, you know, the technology has been changing the whole time and our relationship with technology has been changing. Uh, the music industry itself has been yeah. changing. Um, so it, it was end up starting over in certain respects on the other hand i i had my name i have my songs right a lot of people know my name and my songs and my voice and so it, in that respect i was not i was yeah. continuing and in the a way that audience. younger artists don't have to do you know younger artists i think probably have to fight harder to establish themselves um as an ongoing presence yeah because you, you already had your core audience I, I and again i think the um maybe the 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 oddest part was the fact that you did start on a major label a and m it did really well second album did even better you know that most most young artists don't get to start there i know <laughs> <laughs> I, I know uh the record label was surprised i, I know that they had expectations that we would sell thirty thousand albums total of the first album suzanne vega then I found out we sold 17,000 the first week. And I thought, that's interesting. That's way <laughs> more people than I know personally. I was like, that, how did that happen? Um, and then it just kept selling and selling and selling and selling. We went flying past uh, that 30,000 mark in a couple of months. And then, uh, it, then it went gold and eventually sold a million around the world. Yeah. Um, was, I mean, most would say that you know, that album and maybe one or two others from around the same time sort of triggered that early to mid 80s, um, for lack of a better term, and I didn't come up with it, the neo-folk <laughs> revival of those years. Yeah. So there's, I, there couldn't have been anyone at a and <laughs> who thought it was going to start a whole new movement in uh mostly solo acoustic you know a set you know if it had been 25 years earlier you know straight up folk music records yeah you know i wasn't that surprised because uh the way i saw it was there there are, are great singer songwriters of every era and it's not a fad it's not right. something that comes and goes really you know, you've got your songwriters with the guitar, they're poets, they sit and they write. And you had that in the 60s, you had that 70s, 80s, 90s, beyond. You, you had them 100 years ago, you know, the troubadours, yeah. you had, you know. So like, get used to it. Um, so I figured, <laughs> <laughs> I figured it, it probably opened the door for the artists themselves, but it really, what it really changed the minds of was the marketing directors. Who were like, oh, we can do this. We can sell this. This can actually happen. Yeah. Um, that's where I think the influence was really felt. 
Yeah, yeah, there's always that fine line about what is folk and what isn't. I mean, there are people who, when they come to see the show with me and Jerry, are surprised uh, at some of the choices that we make aesthetically because not everything that I sing is folky. Yeah. You know, we have other songs. We've got songs like Frank and Ava. Or we've got songs like uh, When Heroes Go Down, which is a nice sort of one minute and 54 second uh, kind of new wave-ish song. Um, we have Blood Makes Noise, which we mm -hmm. can do, um, which we've done as a duo, which is, is, is cool. So, you know, it's not all hum and strum as we used to put it. <laughs> down in folk city you know yeah <laughs> right. yeah and oh actually and i think i don't know if you remember this there was a night at folk city and at the time i was going to college on long island so i used to listen to wdre which was the new music right. station and um uh, uh the, the the song from pretty and pink uh left of center Left of center. Yeah, had, I was going to say. Had just come out and was being played on DRE or it might have been LAR still at the time uh, to the point where it became their quote unquote screamer of the week based on listener phone calls. And I think if I remember correctly, you were you were introducing the song at Folk City and I was the doofus in the front row who yelled out that it had just been voted uh, screamer of the week at that radio station. And, and did I respond? You did, you did. You looked at me and sort of like, what, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember playing my father's place. Yep. On Long Island. Uh, and, and somehow there was a correlation between that radio station and my father's place. And it was all going on around that time. Yep. Uh, so that was, that was fun. That, that was one of the nights I went to my father's place. Um, which has just reopened. Yeah. I think it's, I think oh. it's, I, I like Cafe Carlisle. I think it's in a hotel now, if I'm not. Oh, mistaken. okay. Um, but uh, just before we let you go, uh, Suzanne Vega has been our guest here this afternoon at 90.5 the night. I did want to bring up something that I didn't know you did until a day or two ago. Um, and I'm, And I wonder because of the timing of it, did you actually get to finish the run? of Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice off Broadway. <laughs> uh, uh, what an ache. Um, <laughs> we, we had to finish about half a week early. Mm. We, we were supposed to run till the, literally till the end of the week and everything closed down that Thursday. Right. So uh, we just missed the ending uh, of that run. But it was thrilling doing it. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, but it was, it was great. I got to play all these different characters, do different voices, to different uh, types of people um, and sing the Duncan Sheik score, which was just awesome. It was great. I really and loved it. And if anyone's wondering, you were not Bob, Carol, Ted, or Alice. I was all the other people in the show. <laughs> Anyone that was not Bob, Carol, Ted, or Alice, I played them. <laughs> um, and, and it was um, like, I, and as I found out about this the other day and, you know, sort of, did a quick deep dive into it. I, I must, I, I guess I went into the, into it assuming that it was your music. And then all of a sudden I realized it was Duncan's music. And yeah. that also made sense. Cause I know uh, you and he worked on the Carson McCullers. Uh, yeah. We worked too. together on the Carson McCullers play together. <laughs> yeah. He's awesome. I've known him a very long time. He's great. He's really, really talented guy. Yeah. I mean, and it's, and I mean, you know, writing songs or and or scores for Broadway shows or film or something like that for you know anyone who's normally in the the, the pop slash rock world. Um, I think it's always a little surprising when <laughs> when one of you pulls it off. Um, yes, but I mean Duncan is a perfect example of somebody who not only pulls it off, you know. He, he, he was transformative. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can win the Tony. Yeah. I, I was so proud of him that year when that happened. I just watched it with a sense of awe. I mean, he really took that on and he, it was great. It was, it was amazing. And he's great to work with also. Excellent. Um, so it, uh, was that it for it? I mean, he, I mean, the pandemic cut it a little bit short. 
Was there was there well, ever there an had idea been of talk, bringing it back? There was talk about maybe taking it to England and discussing what, who would go if there was an English run because there was an interest at that point. Um, so I know that the new group, which is the, mm -hmm. the theater that put it on, they've gone on to do other things. They've put on um, Waiting for Godot with John Leguizamo and Ethan Hawke, you know, which is was pretty damn cool. Um, so they're not sitting around waiting for the COVID to, to pandemic to pass. They're moving on with other projects. So we'll see what happens. Um, but I, I'd love to do it again. It was a lot of fun. And uh, now I now I think I actually know my lines. Um, so, <laughs> so I could relax into it. You know, it'd be great. You've had a year and a half to read the script over and over and over. That's right. Get my motivations, like get them there. <laughs> Suzanne Vega here on 90.5 The Night, Brookdale Public Radio. As always, thank you so much for taking some time to hang out with us. Um, reminder, Thursday, October 14th at the Vogel at the Basie in Red Bank. And uh, if it's better for you, Saturday the 16th at the Scottish Rite Auditorium in Collingswood out near Camden. Uh, the latest album, An Evening of New York Songs and Stories, came out last year. Um, have you spent much of the pandemic working on i i realized i was about to sign off and then i said wait that album was last year have you spent yeah. any time in the pandemic working on the next album let's just say i've taken a lot of notes i have a lot of titles phrases ideas bits of melodies that i sing into my voice memo app uh, I haven't actually sat down and, and coalesced all of it. Um, so, but that's for the future. And I'm hoping that will be in not next year, but the year after 2023. Mm. That's what I'm hoping and planning for. Excellent. Always yeah. good news. Uh, yeah. But again, thank you so much for taking some time to hang out with us uh, this afternoon here on Brookdale Public Radio, 90.5 The Nights.